All right, so we got Mike G, who is a music and touring agent at UTA here. And Mike, I got to say, I mean, as a booking agent, the pandemic has probably just been a very fascinating time that's probably been unlike any other time in your career. How's it been? Um, you know, I've always been uh, brought up to uh, really see positivity when negative things happen. And that was pretty much the mindset that I had throughout the entire pandemic. I'm like, how, how can I as like a music touring agent and executive get better during this time? Like, what can I do to myself and my career to, to enhance my career? So it, it had a lot of challenges, uh, more mental, but um, I think, you know, we came away on top at the end of the day. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, looking at some of the names that you were able to land during the pandemic was really impressive. I mean, you have a really strong record of artists. I mean, most recently you got Demi Lovato signed to UTA. What has it been like getting big name artists while there's so much uncertainty and touring itself and everything going on right now? You, you know, um, in the agency world, we're always selling potential clients and, and preaching about our 360 model. So not only in music, but TV, film, brand opportunities, and I saw this as like a real opportunity to really focus on everything outside of touring, everything we always discuss. So I really just kind of zoned in. I attended a lot of TV and film lit meetings, music crossover meetings, and really worked on developing my TV and film uh, relationship skills as far as with different studios and production companies. And, you know, those were, those were like great talking points when I started pursuing some of these clients. Because I knew at that time, a lot of touring agents not going to be checking in with their clients like that. So I saw an opportunity to stay close to my clients, to talk about and, and bring different types of opportunities, which I'm really proud of. And, you know, to pursue some clients that I really wanted to work with. So it really just put that setback became a real opportunity, you know, in, uh, in my eyes. So, you know, we just had to get better. And I think we did. Do you find that the uncertainty made anything challenging in that type of way? Because I'm sure the next question that artists have after they're able to reevaluate is like, okay, well, when can I go back on tour? Um, yes and no, in a sense that because no one really knew when touring was coming back. We knew in 21 by the, because everybody thought we were going to be back in the office last June. And when we weren't in the office last June, Everyone knew their touring wasn't coming back in uh, in 21. I was always optimistic that it's going to come back in 22. I was of that mindset. Um, summer 22. I, I, I've been saying that for about a year. Summer 22 will be back. Uh, arenas would be back in fall. And it, it's happening right now. You know, as you know, as vaccines roll out and you see these festivals blowing out early, like everything's just going on sale, you know, on the festival side and selling out. It, it, it's happening. So I kind of always stuck to that and always told my clients what I really felt, but no one really knew, but I was close. <laughs> I'd say you were pretty close because I think that there were a few artists and festivals that were aggressive, and I think timing did work out where they planned it fall, winter, or fall 2021, at least they were able to get it there. And the early 2022 ones, most of them at least look like they're still good. So yeah, I do think that your summer 22 prediction was good there. I'm interested to see what it's still going to be like, though, because I feel I feel like even though they haven't happened yet, there may be a bit of a squeeze where there are just so many big acts that want to tour at the same time. And I think it's great. So many of us want to see everyone that's out there. But I wonder at any point, like, is the demand for everyone at once going to impact anything for for those artists? That's a great question. I think, look, when you look at uh, summer 21, there's a lot of big hip hop tours going out. You know, we have we have Little Baby and Little Dirt going out. You have Trippy Red going out. There's just a bunch of Rod Wave, I believe, is going out. There's a, there's a lot of tours going out, so there's a lot of competition in the marketplace. Um, you know, avails become a problem, but I've always felt like if a promoter, and when I mean avails, like availability on the venue, if the venue is available because there's there's so much traffic. But I've always felt like if a promoter, whether it's a live nation, AEG or independent, they really want to show, they'll figure out how to clear that date for you. So a lot, lot of competition. We'll see how all these tours do at the end of the day. Some of them are doing better than others. Um, and that's just a reflection how everybody 
is excited to get back to a show to go see a show or go see a concert. Mm. Any trends that you've noticed in terms of the shows that are doing better right now versus the ones that aren't? Good question. Um, I don't get everyone's ticket counts t tougher to tell, but I just feel like since, you know, historically, uh, when you go out to the amphitheaters, primarily most of the tours right now are, are in the amphitheaters. You know, Live Nation owns a, primarily most of those amphitheaters. Those tours tend to sell quicker as the show comes up. There's a lot of walk-up business. So, you know, it, it's very rare, like, something sells out on pre-sale. Like, we put up Kid on pre-sale, sold out. New York sold out. LA sold out, like, within the first hour. Sold out pre-sale, the O2 in London. and But that's an indoor uh, tour. So it's just... It's, it's, you know, he's hot right now. So the, the market, there's a demand for him. He's never toured in the US. But like when it comes to the amphitheaters, usually the raps are a lot stronger as the, as the show comes, as the show date comes closer. I can see that, especially now, just given the comfort of people wanting to be outdoors and the size of artists that are looking for that. And yeah, I know you mentioned WizKid. I know that timing obviously works out well for him. I want to talk about two of the artists that you have that have been doing really well. And I think things are working out pretty well for them. Kid Leroy and Young Thug. What has it been like? Let's start with Kid Leroy first. What has it been like with him? Just because he's someone that's been rising so fast recently in the industry and being able to both expect and meet the demand for where his um, interest is from a fan perspective. I'm sure that must be exciting, but it's also a bit of a, a bit of a good guessing game too, just getting a sense for, okay, we see what the streaming numbers look like. How does that translate to ticket sales now? You, you know, it's been amazing just seeing his rise. Um, you know, Kid Leroy got on my radar, I think around February of 2020, and I was watching it very closely. And by the time November, December came around, I'm like, I got to work with this guy. You know, it, I, it, you know, and uh, I was really excited because I saw where it was going. And as soon as we started working together, by February of 2021, we got him in the building. We met with him via Zoom, obviously, and I, I just knew this kid just had something really special in him. He was very funny, very charismatic. And, you know, just, you know, when you draft someone, you know, when you're going to the league and you know this this guy is going to be the one, <laughs> that was always the feeling with him. And, uh, you know, he hasn't disappointed. And when you meet with his family, his mom was a talent executive in Australia and his dad was signed to Simon Cowell in Australia and his brother's a 15-year-old phenom producer. It all makes sense. You see why this kid is so special. And, 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 and the talent he possesses. And for the most part, you know, the 21 strategy was we just kept saying no. Festivals were offering on him. We just kept saying no, no, no. And it just increased the demand. And when we got an offer for playing Reading and Leeds in London, third to closing to Post Malone, I'm like, wow, this is real. And uh, he has not disappointed. He definitely has not disappointed. You know, we did a pop up show at the Palladium last Tuesday. 8,000 people registered. He announced it the same day. 3,000 people showed up. Uh, it was like a 2,000 a cap parking lot. So, you, you know, you get to be a part of that and you get to witness it. It's it's a, something really special. And, and he, he's very special. And he works extremely hard and he definitely deserves all the success he's getting right now. So talk to me about turning down those festivals, because I'm sure there's some trade off there, right? On one hand, you're holding out and things didn't work out. But in the moment, I'm sure you also are like, okay, well, if we did take this festival, what's the benefit of that? What was that decision like? Uh, you know, the model, was, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. In, in January, February, March, when offers were coming in, we didn't really know if festivals were really going to come back, even though we were optimistic. So I was in the mindset with, with the team. Let's just turn down everything, focus in on the music, and come back in 22 with a bigger demand. That really was the mindset. The power of knowing, the power of walking away creates a demand. And I know it's hard for a lot of artists and a lot of managers and agents to, to, to have that strategy. With him specifically, it worked. And we're, we're, I mean, we're still utilizing that strategy. We're not going to confirm anything for 22 as far as like festivals are concerned. Because we want to put out this headline tour and sell it out and, and, and really build a headline artist. So it's, it's, it's been a very disciplined, 
um, strategic approach that we've had and everyone's on the same page and it's working. It's definitely working. So you had mentioned that there is an 8,000 person event or the venue size. Is that roughly like what you're looking for as he's touring and, you know, building out where you want to, uh, the size of the venues that you want to reach in different cities? Um, well, 8,000 was the verified fan registration. 8,000 people registered to attend oh, a okay. pop-up show that a parking lot, which held like 2,000 to 2,500 people, about 3,000 people showed up. Um, you know, I think as far as capacities are concerned with an artist like that, we'd almost rather leave some tickets at the door. So we'll, we'll announce something really special and you, you, you'll, you'll see the type rooms and, um, you know, like in Australia, we would probably be doing arenas and, uh, in the U S you know, think of, you know, three to 4,000 cap rooms right now, which is a great starting point. And I think we could probably go even bigger, but, you know, we definitely want to approach this the right way, especially in Europe as well. So we're going to be we're going to be strategically aggressive for a first time tour. He's skipped a couple steps. He skipped the 500 caps. He skipped the House of Blues. And we're going to go right into theaters and ballrooms. And from there, you know, hopefully you have the theaters and arenas in, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, holding out worked out well. I think that's the beauty of this era, right? Folks like him that can rise in such a fast time, you're able to see something like that. Let's talk about Young Thug, because you were able to get him to headline a bunch of festivals this year. And it's impressive. Obviously, he is a very proven star. But what was that process like? What is it like making sure that you're not just booking him for one, but you're getting him on as many slates that make sense for him as possible. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, if, when you look at the history of Young Thug, he's one of the most polarizing artists of our generation. And he's an amazing human being. I've never met a hip hop artist that really kind of really puts his friends over like his label mates. And it, it, it's, it's rare to see that. And he's got a great manager and a great team. And, it, you know, that pro this process actually has been since 2018. We, we really have to be working this project for the last three years. And he has never missed a date since 2018, since he signed with us. And I, I just think like anything else, you know, when you're talking to festival promoters and, and, and concert promoters, you know, you have to remind them of, of the, the success this guy's had the last couple of years. I mean, the last couple of projects have gone number one on the Billboard 200. So it's constantly selling them um, what, what, what's proven, you know, like as far as like, Hey, this guy right here, it, it, it should be in the conversation with Travis Scott. He should be in the conversation with Post Malone. Like he he's at that level. Now, how do we get him to this level? And you know, it's been it's definitely been, you know, um, a great challenge, but it's getting there. You know, Lala Palooza this past week, and I think Thug said proved who he is and what he's capable of. And, you know, we, we just gotta keep pushing, you know. Um, and I think the biggest thing with him and his team now is you know, we're really going to focus in on our headline tour for 2022. Focus on selling out all these dates and really getting him to that level where we think he should be. Because I believe he should be in that conversation. He's that good. He's, he's great. And he inspired a lot of the people that we that, that we mentioned and that I think a lot of people would think to be in those spots as well. Like they all reference him as the person and their inspiration. And so many of the projects, I think, speak true to that. So, yeah, that's good to see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him. I'm curious, did you also coordinate some of the other things he's done? Like, for instance, booking him for that Tiny Desk concert that he had had on NPR, which I thought was amazing. That just came out a couple weeks ago. Are you involved with that piece of it, too? Well, we helped connect some of the dots. That was his manager's idea, uh, in, in all honesty. And we just helped connect some of the dots, but they, they quarterbacked that. Um, we made an intro. And he took it from there. So, but you know, again, we love when our clients come to us and 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 help us. They, they let allow us to help them connect the dots for certain things. But that that was his team, and I thought that was fantastic. He was really really amazing on that. So, I love that. Yeah, he really was. He really was. I'm curious from a broader music festival perspective, one of the things that I often see, and I think Bloomberg actually had just put out an article about this. They talked about how each year 
there are in many ways the same acts that end up being constant in festivals, right? So obviously that's good on you all for getting them out there, whether it's Young Thug, I think we're seeing Meg Thee Stallion do a number of festivals. How much of that is purely the coincidence versus, you know, the hustle of you all as the agents making sure that you're working certain people to get them there? Like, how come that I think sometimes some fans may think, oh, these festival lineups do look quite similar. I think I think it's both. I think it's uh, first of all, I think most big concert festival promoters or most festival promoters, they have an idea of who they want to headline. Um, it's it's our job to continually educate them on everything that's going on with the artists at all times. You know, whether it's new music releases, um, anything that's happening with the artists, uh, career wise. Like I find myself always educating our promoters uh, what's happening with with all our acts. Um, I think some of the bigger hip hop festivals, I think, you know, it's getting to the point where they, they're going to need new headliners. You know, you kind of see the same few headliners every year. Um, and that that's going to happen. You know, there's only so many superstars in this game. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both. I, I would say festival promoters usually have an idea who they want to headline. And it's really the agent's job to educate that artist that's on the second line that may not be on the first line. Um, on why he should be the next headliner. Mm. And on that point specifically, how much politicking is there to make sure that an artist gets on a particular line on that music festival poster? You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know if it's politicking. I just think it's pushing, pushing and, 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 and selling what you see. The politicking comes in is, let's say, if I get a headliner booked on a festival, how can I leverage my younger acts to get on that festival to make sure they also get a look since I have the headliner? That's where more of the politicking begins, in all honesty. But as far as the headliner is concerned, you know, it, it's, it just depends. You know, it's like I feel like every festival promoter, even if they're owned by Live Nation or AG, operate independently on who they want as their headliner. That makes sense. Yeah, in a lot of ways, I've never played a festival, but it does remind me of planning a conference where, yes, your keynote speakers set, set help set the tone for everything else that you're doing. And I think in many ways can help bring in others depending on how they're lined up. So that does make a lot of sense. But yeah, I asked the question about the uh, name placement on the posters because I always hear that being this discussion, right? Someone being like, oh, how is so-and-so in the fourth spot and this person's in the second spot? And sometimes, of course, you know, fans can assume that it can be for a number of different reasons, but maybe it is a bit more of the push and it's a bit less, you know, indicative of the things people hey, may think it is. I'm going to go ahead and go on record and tell you the biggest challenge for any agent is when their artist sends you a flyer, whether how they're billed or why they're not on the festival. I get I get DMs, text messages from artists all the time. And um, the reality is when you, when you like, I, I think this is important for all artists to understand. When festival, and we're, we're talking about festivals. When festival promoters are booking you, they're looking at a couple things. Does the artist have a massive hit record? That helps. Or how many tickets is that artist worth in the marketplace? So if I'm playing a festival, let's say I'm playing Jambalaya in Texas, how many tickets am I worth in, in Dallas? You know, like th those components play a big factor on, on, uh, on festival billing. Because if you're an artist with a hit record and I can do an arena, most likely you're a headliner. You're not going to be on the second or third line. So if you're on the fourth and fifth line, you might be worth a thousand tickets in that marketplace and you may just be buzzing online. So you know, those are always a little bit more difficult conversations to have with artists and, and the teams, but the ones that get it, get it. They understand and it should be used as motivation, you know? So you know, it all comes down to touring and how many tickets you're worth in the marketplace. That really is what's gonna elevate your career on the festival side or anything else. Right. And I could imagine too, that there's this pyramid aspect of headliners than everyone else based on their billing, right? And they obviously know that there's only so many headline spots at the four or five biggest festivals in the country. So if you want to perform and there's already someone else pushing for them to be a headliner, then 
you may have to wait until 2023 to get there. Like, for instance, I just saw that um, Frank Ocean was named a headliner for Coachella 2023. And now we'll probably start to see even more 2023 announcements, I feel, because that's where it's at. And people are trying to just plan things early in advance. But if you're Frank Ocean and people believe that you can headline a festival, everything's already booked for 2022. So you got to go that far in advance. Yeah. Yeah. They're already booking their headliners. They have, they have, they're actively booking. That's, that, that is a reality. Fra Frank Ocean is a good example. Always saying no, 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 no. And now he gets the headline offer. So it just shows you that strategy works. <laughs> <laughs> right. It pays off well. It pays off well, especially him with just his brand and everything. I think he can get away with a lot that even some of his peers probably couldn't from that, from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute so. anomaly. And uh, congrats to Frank and all his success. Yeah. Definitely. So switching gears from festivals, talking more specifically about touring again, one of the things that I'm interested in, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, is there have been a number of, not a number, there's been a few bigger artists that have canceled tours in recent years, and it's been due to low ticket sales, or they've given other reasons why. And I remember there was this clip that T-Pain had shared talking about, hey, if any artist cancels a tour, it's because they have low ticket sales, right? And it's been this thing, because I remember we had seen recent things with Nicki Minaj or Chance the Rapper, or even Justin Bieber, who had ended up postponing one of his more recent tours. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, is that common thing? Like, would you say that, hey, like, when artists that are, let's say once they were big and they may not be as big as they were maybe three, four years ago when they're still trying to capture maybe that arena size that they may have had a few years ago. Is that a common thing, would you say? And is that a challenging conversation? Because I could imagine that some of that too, if it is, is baked into this relative thought that, hey, you may have been an arena act three, four years ago, but we may no longer be there. And how do we adjust in a way that can still have everyone feel like they're being taken care of? Yeah, I I look, I think this is where great agents and great managers separate themselves, where ego is not in play. Like, how do we get there? Um, look, there's, there's a number of, to answer the first question, there's a number of reasons why an artist can cancel. It could, could in you know, low ticket sales, absolutely. You know, can, can definitely be, a major factor and hopefully you have a good PR team and a good management team know how to spin that. Um, as far as rebuilding an artist, I, I think as executives, we have to protect our artists uh, and as agents. So we can't always listen to what we know that's going to hurt the artist. Like if the artist wants to do arenas and they're set on doing arenas, then we got to figure out a great, fantastic package because that support package is going to have to be worth real tickets, first thing. Second thing is, I always encourage artists, if you can leave tickets at the door, leave them at the door. Like if you were at one time doing ten to 12,000, why not do five to 6,000? Maybe you don't need to go play Barclays in Brooklyn. Maybe we go do a Radio City and, 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 and market it in such a unique way. It looks bigger than life. Maybe we go do two Radio Cities, you know? So, um. It's, it's, it's our job to protect the artists. And I actually think if the music is timed and what we call it underplays, it could be an underplay. Like a 4,000 cap room not, is not necessarily an underplay for one artist, but it could be for another artist. It, it's okay to do that and create demand and leave tickets at the door and start rebuilding it and figure out what's the right strategy to get back into arenas. Because that is common, you know? It is common. It's just the world we live in. It's, uh, it's like an actor making four or five hit movies and then they have a couple bad movies you know you got to find the right script just to get that actor or actress you know back in those conversations yeah that makes sense and i do think that the actor analogy is key i mean they're it's i imagine it's tough but at some point it's real and this is a business and there's ways to do it up whether yeah you mentioned it's a radio city we can make it something really unique instead of just trying to go for the arenas. I'm curious though, you mentioned it's good to leave tickets at the door. Is there like a rough percentage? Like how many tickets ideally do you like to leave? Or like, how do you normally look at that from a capacity perspective? You know, that that's, 
we all, we always use that term. We like to leave tickets at the door, but if let's say for instance, if I sold out a 3,500 cap room venue right away within the first hour, it, you know, I'd love to have another 3,500 out the door waiting to, to see the act because it, it'll, you know, it, it, it'll only create that much more. You always want what you can have. It'll only create that much more anticipation, whether it's on the next run or whether you're holding a second night on, at, at the same venue. So I don't know if there's like a real number. I mean, the more, the better, obviously, but I mean, that's, that's definitely, you know, it's growing and it's headed in the right direction when, when, when that's happening, you know? So, right. That makes sense. It's kind of like the restaurant, right? You want to have people see that there are people in line waiting outside and that's how you're able to just generate more demand and keep the buzz going. So that, that's what all I the hot nightclubs do, that. right? They, they like leaving people at the door, <laughs> even if there's like two people in the room, they just, it's, it's, it's optics, <laughs> it's perception, you know, per, you know, perception is reality in our business. Exactly. Exactly. So switching gears a bit again, I want to talk a little bit about your background specifically, because prior to being a music agent, you had managed Chris Brown. I'm curious, not just how that was, but what drew you to, you know, leaving that to then being a music agent? You know, it, it, you got to go back. I'm going to age myself. Uh, right out of college, I started working in radio and I did radio sales for nine years. So I sold advertising sales for nine years. I, I did it for Clear Channel, which is iHeart at the time, then CBS. And then the last two years of my career, 2007 to 2009, um, I was working at a radio station in Los Angeles called Power 106, which is a massive hip hop radio station in LA, equivalent to Power 105 in New York, KML in the Bay. And I, I used to go out so much. I used to start, I started managing DJs on the side and booking DJs in LA and Hollywood and the Hollywood area. And it's funny because I had my day job, but I was just doing that on the side just for fun. And then one day, uh, the LA leakers brought me an artist at the time. His name was your boy. And he had a record called we run LA. Like, and he, they played me the record. I'm like, yeah, this record is fire. And I had no idea how to manage an artist. Well, I'm like, I guess we could try this. You know, at the time I was watching entourage, I was a big fan. I was like enamored with the, the Hollywood agent manager lifestyle. So I'm, I'm sure that played an influence. And we started working with this artist and that record blew up till today. It's one of the most played records in LA history. And that, at that time I decided, you know, I've been doing corporate America for nine years, radio for nine years. It's, it's okay for me to move on and kind of bet on myself. I'm like, you know, if I ever were going to do something right now, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bet on myself today. And I took a chance and it was a grind and a struggle and, did a good job with your boy and lo and behold one day akon calls my phone and this is at the time when akon was just on fire he was everywhere and that changed everything you know so from uh working with akon you know i started he put me on his management team and i was doing a lot of bookings for him on the live side and helping him uh relaunch con live distribution so i really learned about the label side going on tour with him and uh, it was just, it was an amazing experience. It, it was a big gamble at the time. It was a big gamble at the time, but I bet on myself and it worked out and I never looked back and I always had the mindset, I'm not going to fail. Like I'm not going to go back um, and work a corporate job in, in that sense. I'm going to, I'm going to really bet myself in this music. So that, that's how it all began. And then I just started managing and I just learned all the, the uh, tactics and strategies and techniques i learned as a sales rep. You know, it's pretty much using it as a manager and dealing with promoters and labels and publicists. And honestly, I was learning on the go and it was, you know, the, the best way to learn is to be thrown in the action. That really is the best way. So it's, it's a real non-traditional background, especially being an agent now, but it, I wouldn't trade it for the world because you see things from a macro perspective and then getting a chance to work with Chris for like four and a half years, five years, his comeback years, I wouldn't have traded that either because it really elevated all my relationships and it's something I would never trade in. And it was one of the greatest runs any artist has ever gone through as far as like making a big comeback. And, you know, th those memories will live forever. 
Talk to me about those Chris years specifically, because I'm sure coming into it, you knew that this was going to be a challenge. You knew that this wasn't going to be an easy thing, just given where it was. Talk to me about that and what it was like from the start of it and then to the end of that four and a half years. You know, um, when I was brought uh, when I was brought in working with Chris, there were a couple other managers in play and eventually Chris wanted to work with me. And, um, I, I think for the most part, you know, you know, we spend so much time, um, together, it became more of like a brotherhood. So, you know, you always mm. want to fight for your brother. And what all, year was this, by the way? This was 2012. I met him August, 2012. So 2012, uh, we started working together and, um, literally by, I want to say by 2013, I had taken over solely by myself as the manager. And we, we were just focused. We were focused on putting out great music. We were focused on rebuilding all his relationships. I had great relationships with, with radio at the time. So it was, it was a, you know, I started tapping back into iHeart and CBS and rebuilding those bridges. And it was fantastic. You know, it's just, uh, we caught some big records. You know, Loyal, New Flame, put out two arena tours, amphitheater tours in the same year. It was, you know, the business was there. And I think at that time, he was like the biggest artist in the world, to be honest with you. So it was great. You know, a lot, a lot of hit records, uh, definitely good times, and but def definitely a lot of challenges. You know, I just always felt with Chris that I knew him on a personal level. And, you know, I just always felt that I'm going to fight for this guy because I, I, I see someone different than what the media puts out. So, you know, and... Uh, I think it worked out pretty well for him at the end. I would say so. I imagine you also probably had to have a similar type of conversation over and over because I'm sure once you had started to try to have some of those conversations where you're using your connections to vouch for him and given their impressions of him, you probably faced some pushback. Uh, every day. I would imagine. <laughs> every day there was pushback. There was, there was never a day of no pushback. So that's why I'm. it's always been... I've always felt like I'm, I have the ability to have a very uncomfortable conversation with an artist to do something that the artist doesn't want to do. And I've always said the great execs can convince artists to do what they don't want to do. If an artist, if you know an artist should play a radio show or go sit with a, a, a programmer, but the artist doesn't want to do it, it's your job to convince that artist and, and, and let them know the big picture. This is why you want to do it. Because when we're going for a number one record, they can help. Because, you know what I mean? Because you played the show, because you have this personal relationship. Because at the end of the day, we're in the relationship business. It's all about relationships. And, um, yeah, of course, he didn't want to do a lot of the stuff, like, you know, like, like PR and media stuff. And, and you know, we were very strategic and we had a great team at the time as far as, like, picking and choosing the right people we want to partner with. But, yeah, every, every day. There was, it was always major pushback. It was, a, it was my university mm -hmm. in the music business. And I'm sure over time, like once he saw the results, he was probably more willing to play ball and be like, okay, no, I get why you're making me do this. Yeah. Be honest. He was very coachable when, uh, when I worked with him. So it, it, it was great. Like he, he was very, very coachable at the time. And I appreciated that, you know, and, uh, he, he understood the big picture. He understood that at the end of the day, this is in my best interest. So you know, it worked out well. Yeah. And for him specifically and loyal, cause that was 2014 yes. when that dropped and when you were getting ready to drop that, did you know that that was the one like, Oh, this is going to be the biggest record of this year. And I forget if it was specifically, but just from a feeling perspective, when I think about 2014, it's like that and maybe two other tracks that I think about that, that, what, what took that record over the edge is when the video dropped because the record had been out for like a month or two, but the record really didn't take off till the video dropped. Once the video dropped, and I still remember we shot that at City Walk, um, I think past midnight. Like that was like a special night. And when it dropped, that, that's what really took it over like to, to that next level and became like the anthem that year. Yeah. Yeah. It was a moment. It was definitely a moment. Was it tough letting that go to become to uh, become a music agent? It, uh, 
you know, at the time um, I left in 2016, took nine months off and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, to be honest with you. You know, I, uh, the management thing ran its course. I left on my own terms and I took nine months off and I was talking to everyone. I, you know, I was interested in TV and film. Um, I was talking to some pretty prominent managers at the time, probably maybe, maybe going in there and starting a new venture. And uh, lo and behold, I had a relationship at UTA because at the end of 2015, top of 2016, I had met a couple partners there and they ended up signing Chris. So I was actually a client of the agency. So I was very familiar with uh, some of the bigger partners uh, and board members. So the transition going into UTA was a little bit smoother just because of my relationships uh, in that building. Um, but as far as like adjusting to becoming an agent, I've always looked at, hey, whether you're booking shows or festivals, I have a certain mindset with an artist. And I necessarily didn't come up in the mailroom, um, but I think I can help other agents see things from a broader perspective. You know, because I, I, you know, I, I've been in this business for a while and I've seen a lot of different aspects of it. So, yeah, you know, everything is transitional, you know, but I also think the nine years I did in radio and working in corporate America helped me transition into becoming an agent, to be honest with you. It just, it, it, it I had that discipline where I could go into the office every day and, and attend staff meetings and, and, and do all the company stuff. So, yeah, you know. I hear you on the experience from other areas that are still transferable here. I mean, I did not work directly in music when I first started my career, but there are so many things related to what I do now that are relatable, whether it's how I'm breaking down things, how I'm doing things as well. So I hear you. I think in a lot of ways, the people that have that alternate experience, especially at some point in their career, can often bring that fresh perspective that gives them you know, that unique take that the mailroom to executive may not necessarily always have in that same type of way. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's good to bring a different perspective. And just as um, I bring a different perspective, I've learned a lot from a lot of my colleagues and peers that did come up through the agency system. And I respect that, you know, um, like, I don't think I could have come up through the agency system, to be honest, because it's, it, it's a tough system, but in, in all honesty, uh, I respect that. You know, it takes a certain kind of person to go through that. Definitely. Definitely. Well, going back to touring quick, um, I'm curious, like, what is the, what do you think once the post pandemic buzz that we're in right now kind of wears off and there's less of the squeeze to get everyone to tour that there is right now for the next 18 months or so? What do you think things look like? What does that future look like? Because I think that there's probably going to be a continued mix of what you already have now, but you also have some of these one-off type of virtual events that I think could be an interesting play for a lot of your artists too, looking at what Travis Scott or Lil Nas X or what Ariana Grande and what they've done with their virtual um, events in these digital environments. I feel like that's a whole nother aspect that will probably be just as competitive as some of the work you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, post the pandemic has made us think outside the box. So you've seen a lot of these outside the box uh, opportunities with these major artists. And I think that's only going to grow, you know, look, live is never going to go anywhere. The demand for live and where live was uh, pre pandemic was at an all time high. Um, and I think it's just going to continue to escalate. It's, and I think you're going to see more of those type of opportunities with, uh, you know, with Roblox and Fortnite. And I, I don't see that going anywhere. You know, I think it's just going to eventually continue to grow and we're going to continue to see different ideas, different virtual ideas, possibly have both worlds collide and meet together. And it's going to continue to grow. And I think that's going to be only beneficial for the artists. You know, the, the goal of an artist is to be everywhere. So if I could be somewhere virtually and I could be in your city the same night, you know, that, that, that's, that's what the artist wants. They want to be everywhere. They want to be on every station, every blog, if it's good press. Um, yeah, they definitely want to be everywhere. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited to see what that front looks like. I'm also excited to see what these virtual 
artists look like too, like Michaela or, and I know that she's been signed to one of the big agencies, but I feel like there's only going to be more of those and them also performing, whether it's alongside or in there, um, with, um, actual artists themselves. I think that whole world is going to be unique too. So there's a lot, I'm excited to see what it all looks like. Yeah. Same here. It's going to be an exciting rest of the year, 22 going into 23. We'll stay tuned. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Mike, this is great. Um, we talked about a lot of projects that you have and a lot of um, some of the big things that you've done recently, but is there anything else that the Trapital audience should know about or tap into before I let you go? Look, I'm, I'm excited about the roster I'm working with this year. Um, Little Wayne, Young Thug, Demi Lovato, Kid Leroy, um, all these great artists that I'm working with. I've, I've been very fortunate and blessed to work with some great talent. And I just appreciate you taking the time and speaking with me. And hopefully we'll be back at the show sooner than later. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, no, we'll have to get an update. I think you got a lot of good stuff going on. We'll have to get an update. Let's check in next year sometime. Let's see how things are going with um, uh, the artists and everything. All right, good sounds stuff, good. Man. Well, hopefully see you at a show yeah. soon. Yeah, I'm hoping. Uh, I have not been to a show yet. I mean, I give credit to everyone that went to Rolling Loud, but I got to get to one soon. So hopefully I can get on one uh, of these. That, I, can get I was at Rolling Loud and Lalo the last two weeks. Oh, nice. So what do you have next? Um, roll, I was at Rolling Loud, Lala, and then we have High Festival in Utah um, this Friday and Saturday. So uh, we have a couple artists playing. Nice, nice. Good stuff. Then off IG. to Reading and Leeds Thanks in London, Lyrical Lemonade. It's it's packed. It's a busy schedule. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got a slate. <laughs> you got a slate for sure. For sure. All right. Well, Mike G, this is great. Thanks for coming out, man. Th thank you so much for having me. appreciate it.